Men, if you call every man your home for getting in, getting healthy, getting strong, and getting going, then we have a special ask for you. We need men like you to stand in the gap with us as we take back territory for God's kingdom with our new giving campaign. We're calling it the 12 for 12 giving campaign. And all it takes is $12 a month for 12 months. Now your commitment and donation will help us reach our 20 city goal with our Dangerous Good Conference in 2021. And we can't do this without your support. Now, if you haven't noticed, every man is on the move and we've been able to build an army of strong men that are choosing Jesus over the world. You know why? That's because of people like you that help our ministry thrive, especially in these difficult times. So will you join us and commit to donating $12 for 12 months? Every dollar equals change, not only in the men, but also change for the women, children, and communities connected to these men. Thank you in advance for your support and God bless. Welcome to the Men's Global Livestream. If you have a Bible, you'll want to hold a spot in Psalm 27, and you'll also want to keep your finger in Daniel chapter 1. You know, I think today we can all agree that we live in a digital culture. And in a digital culture, waiting is like a foreign concept. I mean, isn't that the push and purpose of advances in technology to shrink wait times versus expand wait times. Now think about it. You click a button and your heart's desire can land on your porch in one or two days. You press send on text message. It can travel halfway around the world in seconds. On my mobile app, I can wake up, grab my phone uh, on, on the desk, and I can order coffee from bed, walk into the coffee store, pick up my coffee, walk out of the coffee store, talk to no one, get back in my car, easy as that. Don't know the answer to a question while you're talking with somebody or having a conversation at the dinner table or, or with a friend? No problem. Open a browser on your smartphone and you will have the answer literally in seconds. So it's no surprise that living in that kind of culture that when things take a long time, or they take longer than we expected, we get impatient faster. And listen, especially with God. You see, when you get to know the God of the Bible, you discover that he's really not in a hurry. Why? Because he knows that quick for us doesn't always mean quality when it comes to a sense of timing. In fact, he will intentionally delay things to accomplish things. You ever notice that with God? He'll delay things happening in our lives to develop trust in him. He'll, he'll delay things to develop faith, to develop character, to develop dependence on God. And being in God's waiting room, which is where some of us are at this very second, it tests our resolve, our resolve to stay committed to God's purposes while we are forced to wait for his answer. You see, when we're waiting, it's like a battle. Uh, there's other voices tempting us not to wait. There's other solutions that tempt us not to wait on God and wait for his answer. There's other solutions while we wait. So because at every man we know it is such a battle to wait, we're starting a new series called Resolve. And the whole goal of the series is to help you while you're in God's waiting room. So this is what we're going to do over the next several weeks. We're going to get God's mind on when our spiritual resolve is tested. And we're going to see what he wants us to do while we wait. And then we're going to study some men who resolved to stay committed to God as they waited for his answer. And then as we look at these men of God, these men of faith in God's word, we're going to see what they model. And then we're going to seek to apply what they model in our own lives. Because here's the reality. There is something in your life. There is a problem or a situation 
that you would love to be resolved. And because it's unresolved, it's testing your resolve to stay committed uh, to God. So let's get started in session one, and let's get God's mind on remaining confident while we wait for his will to come forward in our lives. In Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14, it says this, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. See, in this series, Resolve, we have to recognize that God, while we wait for his answer, uh, encourages us to wait on him. Now, we want to talk about what that is. What is waiting for the Lord? Well, waiting for the Lord is giving the situation to the Lord, talking to the Lord about a situation you'd like resolved, being open, and that's a key, to what the Lord wants to do on that issue. So if you have a problem and your problem is unresolved and you're processing that problem with God and other people, the Bible says to wait on the Lord, wait for his answer. And it's not sit and twiddle your thumbs, it's actively partner with God. You see, we can wait on the Lord or write this down, we can run ahead of the Lord. You ever done that? Where you're just kind of talking to God about something and then a little fear creeps in and you're worried that he won't be able to meet your needs the way you think they ought to be met. And then you run ahead of him and you do your own plan. Well, the Bible says wait versus run ahead of him. Secondly, the Bible says wait versus run away from him. You see, sometimes God's saying, nope, I want you to do it this way. And doing it God's way may take a little longer. And instead of doing it God's way and doing it the right way, we just kind of run away from how God is asking us to do this. And we just run away from God, right? That's one way to get the solution met uh, in the situation. Or number three, we can wait or run with our own plan. So we can wait versus run ahead of him. We can wait on the Lord versus run away from him. And we can wait on the Lord or we can run ahead with our own plan in pride. Pride says, I know better, all right? Fear says, I know my needs better, all right? And so those are the ways that we respond a lot of times, just as men who get a little impatient when we want God to speed things up instead of waiting on him. But the Bible says this, wait for the Lord, be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Now, why wait on the Lord and partner with the Lord and talk to the Lord and give every situation of your life that needs resolution to God? Because in the wait, I commit to his will because I'm convinced his answer is best. See, our life in God will reflect our view of God and you won't wait on the Lord if you don't have a right view of God. And the Bible says that God is good, that God is able, that God knows what's best. And so the encouragement is to wait for the Lord. We see in the Bible many instances of people waiting on the Lord and what it means. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse seven, it says this, because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a stone determined to do his will, and I know that I will not be put to shame. You see, Isaiah knows his God. He knows that God is trustworthy. And although answers aren't coming the way he wanted it and when he wanted it, you know what he says? He says, the sovereign Lord helps me. Who's the sovereign Lord? The one that's in control of everything, the, the God that's above every situation. And so because he knows the sovereign Lord and because he knows that God won't put him to shame, he, he says this, I have set my face. In other words, he's focused, he's set, right? And I'm determined to do his will. Can I ask you a question? As you wait for God to answer something in your life, as you're working with God, right? Are you waiting on the Lord by determining to do his will regardless of when he answers? You see, the Bible promises that the sovereign Lord 
will not disgrace you. He will not put you to shame. And here's the bonus of waiting on the Lord versus running away from him or ahead of him or with your own plan. It says it in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, key verse for our series, all right? But those who wait upon the Lord get fresh strength. They spread their wings and soar like eagles. They run and don't get tired. They walk and don't lag behind. You see, as you actively wait on the Lord, as you give it to God, as you talk to God, as you're open to the Lord's solution, as you resolve to be a man of God on a certain issue and wait for his answer, the Bible says you get fresh strength. You actually get stronger, not weaker. God's purposes are being accomplished. And listen, like an eagle, you stop being a low-flying person who's all caught up in the trees and in the woods of a problem, and you actually begin to rise above the lack of an answer or the lack of change and into some other purposes that God has intended to happen in the waiting. That ever happened to you? Where God has delayed an answer and then you've given it to God. And then there's some other things that happen before the answer that make the solution or the resolution of the problem whole. But if you didn't have to wait, none of those things would ever happen. That's what the Bible's saying. And one of the great things that happens is that your faith gets strengthened. You begin to rise above the lack of an answer or the lack of change and get into some other purposes that God intends. So that's God's mind on waiting with spiritual resolve, determining that you're going to be God's man no matter how long it takes. And so let's now look at a man who really did well while he was waiting on God to bring a solution. And his name is Daniel. He's a very famous character. You might know him about Daniel in the lion's den, right? Or Daniel the, the exile, right? And that's the context of his life. Daniel lived during what the Bible calls the exilic period or during the Babylonian captivity. The Babylonians take the nation and community of Israel hostage and bring them to Babylon. And Daniel is in this select group of intelligent, strong, handsome guys that are being trained to be the future leaders in Babylon. And so when we look at Daniel's life, we're going to look at some ways that he kept his resolve. And then here's what I want you to listen for. As we examine Daniel's life in captivity, waiting for deliverance, is I want you to just look at what he does and then see if you can't apply that to your own life. And so let's look at the first thing that Daniel did while in captivity. And the first thing he did in his wait is he set spiritual boundaries in his wait. What does that mean, to set a spiritual boundary? That means that Right at the outset of this waiting period, he decided before anything pressured him that he was going to be God's man. Listen to what it says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel, the captive, put in God's waiting room, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now, you might look at this and go, well, if they feed him, he should eat the food that he, he gives them. But the problem with the food that they would give Daniel was that that food most likely was sacrificed to idols before they ate it. And that would violate his commitment to God during this waiting time. And so I love the language that the Bible uses to describe Daniel. He says, but Daniel resolved. In other words, Daniel set a boundary. Daniel said, you know what? I'm going to not defile myself with food offered to idols. And so now I have to take a step of faith. And now I, ask, I have to ask the boss, the guy who's over our little cohort of men, to not eat the food that is being given to him. right? And he didn't say, and I want you to replace it with stuff. But then what ha ended up happening is that Daniel took a step of faith. He resolved not to compromise in his weight, and he said, all right, let's do a test and see who's stronger, the, the guys who eat 
fruits and vegetables that I'm requesting, not dedicated to idols, or the guys who eat the king's food. And sure enough, God honored that request. But you see, the principle here is that we have to decide before we get in the pressure. We have to decide that we're gonna be God's man no matter what happens. So if you're in a situation and you're waiting on God to deliver an answer or deliver you from a circumstance, you know what my encouragement to you is and what the model of Daniel is, is set some spiritual boundaries ahead of time that where you just say to God, hey, no matter what, you say to God, you say to yourself, you say to other people, hey, no matter what happens, I'm not gonna compromise my walk with God like Daniel. He resolved to set some spiritual boundaries, all right? Now, Jesus, uh, in Mark chapter nine, he talks about this whole idea of knowing yourself and knowing that you're vulnerable and, and taking a predetermined path, right, in advance of the pressure. Jesus said in Mark 9, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to lose a part of your body and live forever than to have two hands and go to hell where the fire never goes out. Now, Jesus was using uh, hyperbolic language. Uh, he, was, he was communicating with force. And he's just saying, hey, if, if you know that you'll be tempted by something, all right, eliminate the temptation in advance. By what Daniel did, all right, he eliminated the temptation. He went out and said, hey, I'm not eating food sacrificed to idols. He set the boundary in advance. Why? Because he knew that that would compromise his commitment. Jesus, in saying, if you know that your hand causes you to sin, and otherwise, if you know that you could be made vulnerable, buy something, cut it off, make a rule, all right? Set a boundary and you might lose an opportunity or something that others might enjoy, but you'll preserve your commitment to God. You won't sin. So that's the first thing that Daniel does in his weight. He sets a spiritual boundary. Secondly, in the midst of his weight, Daniel determines to let God use him. Write that down. He sets spiritual boundaries, and he determines to let God use him. Now, before I get into the passage where Daniel decides to let God use him while he's waiting to be delivered from the situation, let me give you some context. Daniel is in captivity, all right? He's in home confinement. He's in a prison of a situation. And he hears through the prison grapevine and through the, the little network of people and servants in the king's palace that he's having dreams and they can't be interpreted by his, by his wise men. And so because the king, Nebuchadnezzar, is so frustrated that none of his wise prophets can interpret this disturbing dream, he's going to kill them all. Now, let's roll the film and see what Daniel does uh, in this situation. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king and I will interpret his dream for him. How cool is that? Daniel is captive. He has no reason or motivation practically to help these wise men live. But he hears about the situation and he knows what he can do. Daniel has a prophetic gift. He can interpret dreams. So here he is in the middle of a situation. These guys can't do it. He sees a gap. The king gets frustrated. He's going to execute all these guys because he's, he's mad that they can't interpret his dream. And then he steps in to fill the need. You know, while you're waiting and you're talking to God and giving your situation to God, there are needs around you that need to be met. And God is asking you, as you trust him with the outcome of your answer, and you know him and you know that his answer will be right in his time, that frees you then to be available to help others. You know, that's one of the great things about knowing God. I, I know that just like me, you have issues that are going on in your life. And you could obsess and focus and be self-absorbed in those issues. But because we know God, and because we're talking to God, and because we're trusting to God, in our waiting room, we can resolve to let God use us. 
during our wait and be available to other people because God's got us. In fact, I want us to say that together. Just say, God's got me. All right, did you say it? God's got you. And if God's got you, that means that you can free yourself in the midst of your situation with your situation unresolved to help other people. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 41, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. See the situation? That's referring to the situation in, in, in Jerusalem and in Palestine where the Romans were occupying and they could force a person to carry their stuff for one mile. And they could just say, hey, you, help me, and I have the authority to ask you to stop what you're doing to help me. So you got a similar situation. you got an occupation, and then you have the pressure of doing things you don't want to do. And then Jesus says, hey, if someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Why? Because you know God, and God's in control, and God has your best interest in mind. And so while we're waiting, we need to commit to let God use us, all right? So the third thing that Daniel does in his wait is he doesn't sin under pressure. Being resolved involved not sinning under pressure. And I want to, before I read the passage, I just want to stress this because I think every man who has an unresolved situation or the pressure of something being unresolved gets vulnerable and gets tempted to make himself feel better because he feels bad that a certain situation is unresolved or not fixed or creating uh, pain, right? And that's a spiritual battle in that moment because we'll be tempted because we feel bad to feel better. And trust me, in 30 years of men's ministry, I know a lot of guys who bailed on their faith because they felt bad and to feel better, they did things that harmed their relationships with God and people. That's universal Every man struggles with that. But you see, Daniel, in his weight, he resolved not to sin under pressure. He might feel bad, he might despair, but he's not going to sin. In fact, in Daniel chapter 3, we see them not sinning by worshiping false gods. Daniel and his buddies, right? And they have interesting Babylonian names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him. Those are the names of Daniel and his friends uh, in Persian. Uh, replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Because they were being asked to worship uh, false gods. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Man, that takes some courage. You got one of the most powerful men in the world, and he's saying, you know what? If you don't fall down and worship my gods, I'm going to throw you into a furnace, all right? And I'm going to fire it up seven times hotter than I normally do, and that's the one that you're going to get thrown into. And these guys, Daniel and his friends, they just say, you know what? God will deliver us from what you're going to do to us, or he'll deliver us through what you're going to do to us. You see, Daniel had the big picture. He's like, hey, our God, he can deliver. And he'll either deliver us from this situation by saving us circumstantially, or deliver us ultimately right into his presence. So either way, we win. So we're not going to sin by worshiping your false gods. Man, that took courage. You know, it takes courage to continue to worship the Lord while you're waiting and not to give in, right, to the false gods out in culture that are telling you, hey, if it feels good, do it, or you deserve it, and, you know, worshiping at the feet of culture versus worshiping your Christ who loves you and died for you, right? And you see, Daniel's perspective should be ours. God can deliver a change to your circumstance right now. But there's some other things going on. Or he can deliver you ultimately. And guess what? God's man is okay with both. But we're not going to sin under pressure, right? So we see Daniel setting a spiritual boundary in his way. We see him letting him God use him in his way. We see him not sinning under pressure in his way. Next, we see Daniel making hard choices for obedience. 
in his way. Not only does Daniel say no to sin while he's waiting, but he says yes to God. You know, there was a, a situation, you know, that we looked at, and that's where there's uh, things that need to be interpreted, all right? And there was a situation where, where God wrote on the wall a message and no one could interpret it, but Daniel could, and he had to make a hard choice to be obedient because he saw what God wrote on the wall, and the result of reading what God said on the wall would mean that that would put his life again at risk. But was Daniel going to be obedient? Yes, he was. In Daniel chapter 5, we see him interpret, once again, God's handwriting on the wall. He says, here is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Wow. He had to be obedient in that moment and say some really hard things and make a hard choice to be obedient to God and to use his gift in his circumstance. You see, the Bible tells us that because when we know God, he gives us not a spirit of fear. We don't fear men. We fear God more than we fear men. In fact, that's what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It says, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. You know, it takes power and it takes love and it takes self-discipline to be God's man while you are waiting for God's answer. And a lot of times we have to continue to make the hard choices versus what? Just kind of wait around and just kind of give ourselves permission to just go, you know, I'm waiting on my own thing with God so I can't serve God or obey God or make hard choices there. I'm just kind of waiting for God to take care of me first before I'll make a hard choice for him. It's kind of like tick for tat. That's not how it works, all right? Daniel made a hard choice to be obedient for God in his wait. Now, when you move along in Daniel's story, we see the next thing that he did to keep his spiritual resolve while he was waiting, and that is he lived for an audience of one in his wait. In Daniel chapter 6, all right, we see, again, a situation rise up. He's the outsider. He's the foreigner. He knows God, and it's culture that he's living him versus his faith in God. And who's going to win? All right, we pick up the, the next chapter in Daniel chapter 6. And the king's advisors are talking about Daniel. And let's roll the film. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. Right? So the king issued an edict that you couldn't pray right, to the God of Israel. Right? The exiles of Judah were prohibited from praying. So not only does Daniel not listen to that, but he opens his window where he's staying so that everybody can see him publicly praying to his God. And so he has the right perspective while he's waiting. He lives for an audience of one. And it's interesting. We see this spirit in Christ as he's living his life on earth. In Mark chapter 12, verse 14, a so almost exact situation comes up where people seeking to trap Christ say this about him. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So there's Daniel, exile from Judah. There's Jesus, all right, who was exiled from heaven and came to earth. And both of these men are connected to God the Father. And while they walk on earth, they do not fear men during this time period where they are in a place where they're not gonna stay and they're waiting and fulfilling God's mission while they wait 
before they return to God. Wow. We see the spirit of Jesus in the spirit of Daniel. What spirit is filling you as you wait for God to resolve a situation in your life? Are you living for an audience of one like Daniel? Well, let's look at the next thing, all right? What does Daniel do in his wait? He chooses responsibility, choosing responsibility in his wait. Write that down. You see, Daniel could have been irresponsible and could have made excuses or justifications or rationalizations for being irresponsible because, you know, time is passing and God hasn't answered and God hasn't delivered. And so, you know what? Uh, I deserve to be a little bit irresponsible. But he doesn't do that. He takes responsibility for himself spiritually in the way. In fact, he confesses his own sin and the sin of his people. Look at what it says in Daniel chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. It says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. O Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. You see, Israel ended up in the situation they were in because of choices that they made. Now, when you get into a bad situation or when you get into an unjust situation or somebody does evil to you, it's easy to make excuses and blame other people or the situation and be irresponsible. That's what boys do, not men. That's what immature people do, not mature people. Daniel is mature. He's a man of faith. Yes, he's in a gnarly situation, but he chooses to take responsibility for that situation while he's waiting on God to deliver him. That's what we need to do. Many of you are watching right now and you're blaming other people or you're blaming your circumstances or you're blaming your boss, you're blaming COVID, blaming, and that is like a hall pass for you to be irresponsible. Can I just tell you right now what the Spirit of God is saying to all men of God watching this this global live stream is that if you have an area of irresponsibility that you are kind of rationalizing, repent. Have a change of mind. Take responsibility confess that sin or that area of irresponsibility and watch God move in your life, all right? Let's look at the last thing that Daniel does in his wait to stay resolved. What does he do in his wait? He's staying prayerful, write that down, in his wait. You see, we have situations that are unresolved and then we sort of talk to God about it and then we just say, well, God, you know, you're sovereign, you're good, you're gonna do whatever and then we just stop praying. That's not what the Bible teaches. Daniel, in his way, prayed, and he kept praying, and he stayed in prayer, and situations came up, and he kept prayerful, all right? Look at this situation in Daniel chapter 10. What's going on is that Daniel is still in the waiting room of God, but he's staying prayerful. Another situation comes up, and listen to the perspective of heaven on a praying man. This is an angel talking to Daniel who comes and comforts him in response to his prayer. Then he, the angel said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. So what is the angel saying? The angel said, you know what? You started praying about this a long time ago. All right. You humbled yourself before God. You kept praying. Heaven heard your request, but God delayed the answer coming. And the answer comes. And when the answer comes in the form of an angel, right, the angel says to him, hey, we heard you dial us up right from the beginning. So boy, is that ever a call to prayer and a call to persist passionately in prayer? It's like when Jesus said, uh, told a story about the, the, the widow who came to the judge and knocked on his door every night. And he said, you know what? I don't believe in God and care for people, but I'm going to give this lady justice because she's driving me crazy. All right. Jesus is talking about persistence in prayer. And that's what we need to do. You know what? We just don't need to pray one time. We need to keep praying. We need to pray with passion and persistence. We need to seek so we can find. We need to ask so that we can receive. We need to knock on God's door uh, and so that the door will be open. What's going on in your life that's unresolved? 
keep praying. Heaven is hearing. Heaven is responding, but heaven is responding on God's timing, which is going to be perfect. It's not going to be too early. It's not going to be too late. It's going to be right on time. So what does heaven think about your situation? Heaven wants you to pray, and heaven hears your prayers, and heaven is creating an answer. It might be what you want. It might be something different. It might be something totally different, but it's going to be God's answer. So what does David, uh, Daniel do while he's in his waiting room? Man, he, he sets some spiritual boundaries in advance. He lets God use him. He's not going to sin under pressure. He's going to make some hard choices. He's going to live for an audience of one. He's not going to be irresponsible and immature. He's going to be responsible and mature in this waiting period. And man, is he going to stay prayerful. Whoa, that's a word from the Lord for us. I'm sure there's something in your life that's unresolved. There's uh, an outcome that you want. There's a vision that's unfulfilled yet. And God is saying, do these things. I put this in the Bible to model what you do when you're in my waiting room. I'm creating trust. I'm creating character. I'm creating faith. I'm creating dependence. All right? And you see, the Bible tells us just to remember, all right, that we need to, to live with the end in mind. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, 12. He says this to believers. He says, because of the increase in wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Okay, I want to pause there because what you have is you have an increase in pressure and a duration, all right? What started off hot is growing cold under pressure. All right, let's finish it, all right? Verse 13, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. You see, that's the battle, men. Will you stand firm in your commitment to God while you wait on God to resolve a situation? Well, we have an example here in Daniel. He stood firm to the end. And what does stand firm mean? When you stand firm, it means you, you plant a foot and you're not going to give up ground. You're not going to abandon this space. You're not going to retreat. The opposite of retreating is standing firm. And that's what the Holy Spirit is calling men watching this live stream to do right now. I know there's an unresolved issue in your life that you would love to have resolved, a problem solved, all right? But until that problem is solved, you need to stand firm in your faith. Don't abandon the space of faith. Don't abandon your relationship with God. Don't abandon his commands. Don't abandon people that he's calling you to serve in the midst of your waiting room. Hold that space. Don't give it up because the devil is hoping that you will lose your resolve and that you will give up that space and that he can get involved and destroy and create stumbling blocks. God's calling you to hold your ground. Will you hold your ground today? Will you stand firm spiritually? Will you keep believing? Will you keep praying? Will you keep doing God's will while you are waiting? for God to deliver. If that's your desire, I want you to bow your heads and I want you to pray with me right now. God, together with this community of men, Lord, worldwide, Lord, we resolve like Daniel that we're not gonna defile ourselves with idols, with impulses, Lord, with self-indulgence, with rationalization or justification for not obeying you, Lord. We're committing right now in Jesus' name to stand firm, Lord, we're going to keep believing that you're at work, and because you're at work and you know the situation, we are free, because you have us, to serve other people, to live for an audience of one, to keep growing, to keep being responsible, to stay prayerful. God, we're praying right now in the midst of our situation, and we're not going to stop praying. We're going to pray every day for you to intervene, for you to honor your word, for you to honor your promises in your time. God, we're going to keep obeying your word. We're going to keep doing your will. Lord, we thank you for the word that you've spoken to Daniel. Lord, we pray that the same spirit that was in Daniel, the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus, Lord, would fill us right now. Holy Spirit, give us a spirit of commitment, of power, of discipline right now. And Lord, I pray for every man who's flagging right now. Lord, he feels like he's about to go under the water. In Jesus' name. God, I pray 
that you would reach down and that you would pluck him out, that you would take him out of the slimy pit, that you would set his feet on a rock, that you would give him a firm place to, to stand, put new words, put new songs in his mouth, show him that you're with him and that you are working it out. God, I know that there are men who are jobless right now that feel like you've abandoned them. You've not abandoned them. In fact, you're saying to them, continue to trust me, continue to believe, continue to pray, and my deliverance is forthcoming. Lord, I pray that those men right now would receive that word. Lord, I know that there are men right now that are waiting on a spouse to change their mind on a certain situation, but they're not gonna change their mind, you are. So I pray that those men would serve their wives in the midst of this waiting period, God, and that you would work through the power of your Holy Spirit to show yourself strong for marriages that are getting attacked. Lord, I pray for men who have given up space. They haven't stood firm. Lord, I pray that you would just put your strength and power in their spiritual foot right now and that they would plant it right now in the ground, in the spiritual ground, Lord, that they will say in Jesus' name, they are not giving up any more territory in their life and they are gonna advance the purposes of God while they wait. Lord, you're speaking, you're moving, you're changing things right now. There's a shift going on in the hearts of many men that are watching this and you are fortifying them and you are strengthening them and you have heard their prayer and heaven is coming. Lord, so give them faith and confidence and courage to stand and live for an audience of one. In Jesus' name we pray and God's men said, amen. Praise God. He is on the move in your life. Don't budge, stand firm. That's God's word for us today. And if this is your first time watching Everyman, can I just encourage you, download the Everyman app, all right? All of these weekly live streams, so much content, wonderful films, interviews. Uh, we just have so much great stuff for guys. Daily devotions. Man, get the Everyman app. Join the movement of dangerous good men who are standing for God in this hour, in this culture for this time. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Men, if you call every man your home for getting in, getting healthy, getting strong, and getting going, then we have a special ask for you. We need men like you to stand in the gap with us as we take back territory for God's kingdom with our new giving campaign. We're calling it the 12 for 12 giving campaign, and all it takes is $12 a month for 12 months. Now your commitment and donation will help us reach our 20 city goal with our Dangerous Good Conference in 2021. And we can't do this without your support. Now, if you haven't noticed, every man is on the move and we've been able to build an army of strong men that are choosing Jesus over the world. You know why? That's because of people like you that help our ministry thrive, especially in these difficult times. So. Will you join us and commit to donating $12 for 12 months? Every dollar equals change, not only in the men, but also change for the women, children, and communities connected to these men. Thank you in advance for your support, and God bless.